I mean, look, in the end, Kinemon's plan wasn't that hard to understand. You just put the two lions on the snakes, turn it into a lizard, but get rid of some characters, consider how much this whole section just looks like a bra, then turn it upside down, spin it all around, and it is clearly telling you to subscribe to the Grand Line Review for regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. And it really is that simple, because Kinemon is a true mastermind. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a review of chapter 975, Kinemon's Clever Trick. And there is just so much to like about this week's chapter and a lot to digest artistically, because it seems like more than usual, these panels are just chock full of details that you really want to linger on. And a primary example of this is right at the beginning in that wonderful sequence of seeing the shots of all the straw hats aboard the Sunny. And at first I wasn't sure why this hit me quite as hard as it did. I thought that, well, we've just gone through the longest flashback that this series has ever offered us. And it's nice to get back to normality, but it's actually so, so much more than that. Because looking back on it, I realized that not including Jinbei, the the straw hats are all together. And that's kind of weird. I mean, it sounds like such a plain thing, but these nine characters have not been shown in the same place since the very beginning of the Dress Rosa arc, when they were aboard the Sunny and then very quickly went their separate ways, not to be reunited again until this very moment in chapter 975. So surprisingly big stuff, and even though my brain didn't realize it, my wanky inner self sure did, because it's been almost seven years to the day, actually, slightly less because Dress Rosa began on March 4th, 2013, but it's still practically been seven whole years since we have had a moment like this. So already this chapter satisfied a huge craving that I've had, not just all throughout Wano, but throughout most of the New World Era. And so yeah, naturally I found myself lingering on these first few pages, just marveling at what should in theory be a relatively simple experience. But I'm glad I did because taking in all of the Wano battle designs of the Straw Hats is well worth it if you did not do so initially. And there's just so many highlights, Frankie being one of them, with his really cool helmet with a crescent moon adorning it, very Kozuki chic. But one of my favorites has to be Nami. Because look, I don't have my hopes up too high, but seeing her dress for battle, climb attacked in hand and everything is very promising. Plus she just looks fantastic with the flower decoration in her hair, which looks incredibly similar to the ones that Hiori wore. So I'm wondering if they may have had an encounter at some stage or if this is just a common accessory in Wano. And something I noticed last week, but didn't bring up because I forgot with all the hype is the fact that Luffy and Brooke are no longer wearing their samurai attire, which they got from the Tengu Yama in chapter 959. So I do wonder what prompted them to change. Like maybe they got caught up in a battle somewhere, but Chopper still seems to have his gear on. So that's just a bit of an interesting visual note. I do really like how Luffy looks though. More so than ever before, his design feels like that of a captain. And I love that he has the cape on, which is actually very evocative of the cape that Shanks wears. There are also some comments last chapter on Law's outfit, which actually looks a lot like Rosinante's old feathery jacket thing, the sort of gothic version of Dolphamingo's pink extravaganza. And I doubt that it's the same jacket because that would require a weird set of circumstances where child Law somehow gets the coat of Rosinante after his death, but it definitely evokes Rosinante pretty strongly. So thanks to everyone who points that out because I love it. And I'm sorry to keep harping on about design so much, but I also really love Sanji's sleek look here with the black gloves and everything. And in fact, Brooke is also wearing black gloves, which is kind of cool. And I wonder if it signifies some sort of plan that they have to do some sneaky operation together, which is why they're now dressed effectively as international spies rather than in full samurai battle gear. They just look so set up to infiltrate something somewhere and for some reason. But finally, my favorite design revealed in this chapter is 100% the beautiful little cloud that is Zeus. He is beyond adorable. And I'm glad that one of the members of the crew clearly had the thought of, you know what Zeus? Yeah, you need a hat. And I'd love to know who it was because it feels like a very unlikely thing for Nami to do, although maybe. I mean, she's pretty proud about her fashion choices and Zeus is now kind of an extension of her, so look, it's not out of the question. Or perhaps it was Zeus himself who wanted the helmet because he's a pretty fun loving little cloud. But onto the actual substance of the chapter, look, it was filled primarily with a lot of technical revelations. And what I mean by that is it was basically a string of questions and statements and a few actions that provide the solutions to minor plot puzzles, much of which was stuff we already had a pretty good idea about, but this also includes stuff that we blatantly knew, but that had not yet been revealed to the actual characters, such as Denjiro and the Big Mom Kaido Alliance, but we'll start with Denjiro because why not? Denjiro popping into action was a pretty awesome moment and I really enjoyed his display of power, which sees him slice open a gigantic ship with absolute ease, which is one of those trademark moves of the world's most proficient swordsman. I mean, we first saw this idea demonstrated in the Baratier arc, which blew our minds seeing Mihawk easily slice up all of Krieg's armada. But after the time skip, we learned that Zoro 
was now capable of this feat as well. And seeing Tenchiro do the same thing here gives us a very effective tangible cue as to what kind of level of swordsmanry that he currently inhabits. But the best part of Denjiro was definitely when he removed his Kyoshiro disguise. And we are now left with Denjiro's final form. And I have to say that this design is certainly going to take, <laughs> it's going to take some getting used to. I mean, when I first saw it, I thought it looked like one of those cursed images. You know, the ones that tend to take Kizari's face and put them on other characters to create various meme masterpieces? Well, that's pretty much what I felt here. It looks like you've taken Kyoshiro's face and put it on Flashback Denjiro's body. I'm sure I'll get used to it though. But also most of our technical reveals came from this moment as well, when Denjiro explained how their forces had avoided Orochi's plots to stop them by blowing up the bridge and stuff, which was pretty fun. I mean, I completely buy the explanation that Orochi was just inept and acted way too late to stop the plan. Ah, and speaking of plans, the biggest technical reveal comes up with the explanation of why the vassals showed up to no forces whatsoever. And basically this is one of those situations that won't hit as hard as it could in English because the twist here is primarily based in Japanese wordplay. But basically Kinemon took Yasu's message and purposely misinterpreted it as him having drawn legs on a snake, thus turning a snake into a lizard and the Japanese word for lizard is tokage. And obviously all the ports in Wano are named after animals. So Kinemon then led his close group to believe that they were now meeting up at the lizard port, AKA tokage port. But in reality, the two lines were not meant to signify legs, but rather remove characters from Habu Minato, meaning Habu Port, and turning that into Hato, which TLDR means that Kinemon purposely misread the message because he knew there was a traitor within his tight-knit group, which led to Kanjiro being misinformed, which led to Orochi being misinformed. And so Kaido's forces gathered here. And look, in Japanese, this is probably a very simple explanation that makes sense immediately and is likely a brilliant little piece of wordplay. But in English, it certainly does take some digesting. I'm pretty satisfied with this turn of events though, because it means that Yasu's Legacy firstly isn't ruined by Orochi, thwarting his final message, but in fact, it's actually much more profoundly useful than he may have even thought it to be thanks to Kinemon's sudden genius level IQ. So this chapter certainly does leave me with a pretty incredible feeling of respect in regards to Kinemon, who rather deservedly gets the final panel of the chapter with such a strong glare. And for the first time in his history of the series, it really does make me feel like I do not want to mess with Kinemon on any level because he will destroy me. And speaking of destruction, this chapter came with its fair share of very hype action, which saw Luffy, Law, and Kid all leap into battle in what is absolutely my favorite page of this week. It's weird, but there's something so iconic whenever these three are featured together, which is obviously burned into our minds from the first Sabadi arc, where they briefly join forces for the first time. But as a result, seeing stuff like this comes with a side dish of nostalgia because it takes your mind back to when they were simple rookies, and it makes you realize just how far all three of them have grown over the past two years. And I'm still super keen to find out how they eventually convince Kid to join this assault, but his presence is certainly one of the best things that has happened in this arc, especially when you see that that little panel of the three of them arguing because Kid and Luffy pretty much just exist to fire each other up. It's a very different dynamic to Luffy and Law or even Luffy and Beige. One that I find much more exciting and I do love that Law is also there acting as a sort of mediator. And I mean, man, he probably feels beyond frustrated right now because it was hard enough for him just to deal with Luffy, let alone adding Kid into the mix. It's a really powerful combination though. And seeing these three together does give me a ray of profound hope, even if their teamwork is questionable or highly questionable even. I actually think it's more the promise of the Sheer amount of chaos that these three can cause. Because again, Luffy is enough of a force of his own in these sorts of events, but when you add in Kid, who as far as I'm convinced is just another chaotic Luffy type presence, then well, you have a solid recipe for anarchy coming right up. And something I honestly forgot about until I read the chapter through a second time is another one of our technical reveals, which is that a bit of time was taken to inform the allied forces that Big Mom and Kaido had now engaged in an alliance. So obviously that's not news to us, but it is something that our protagonists did need to discover eventually, which I guess has an appropriately subdued effect on the chapter. I mean, the reactions from Kid and Law kind of reflects that of the readers who were just like, hmm, yes, that's interesting because we already know. Although I would like to say that Kid is an interesting one to examine because remember that he does not just have a vendetta against Kaido as he openly declared war against Big Mom and sunk some of her ships, which is why Tamago was so keen to take the treasure from Luffy on Fishman Island so that they could replenish their losses. So Kid hearing this must be like, oh, well, that's two infinitely powerful people that I've pissed off severely present in the one spot. What could possibly go wrong? Whereas you cut to Law and he's just sort of silently shitting himself because to him, this association with Luffy just keeps getting worse and worse. And he's probably casting his mind back to the days of Punk Hazard and regretting ever forming this alliance to begin with. But hey, there isn't anything that he can do about that right now. I also notice that in these two panels, we get to see some of the Kid Pirates and the Heart Pirates, but Killer is noticeably absent from the shot. So I do wonder what's up with that as every other major figure of the Straw Hearts, the Heart Pirates and the Kid Pirates were shown in this chapter. So I guess that Oda is saving the revelation of Killer's presence for another person. 
purpose. And one other thing I wanted to mention before I realized that it wasn't actually true, was that this was the first moment that the Kozuki vassals would have all been gathered together since the Odin incident, which would have been monumental, but then I remember that Nekomomushi is still nowhere to be seen. So the cat is the sole factor preventing this epic reunion from happening right here and now, but that also brings some promise with it as well. Because as much as this chapter had me hyped, even with the forces that Denjiro has acquired, this is still nowhere near enough to take down Kaido and Orochi, let alone Big Mom and potentially her crew as well. Like you can throw all of the numbers of random samurai in the world out there, they are not touching an emperor of the sea. So we are still very much waiting on the Nekomomushi developments to really properly start turning the tide of battle here. And whether he brings Jinbei or the Grand Fleet, the White Bay Pirate Remnants, or anyone else that we've endlessly speculated upon, that is going to be the true signal that world changing events are fully in motion. And I guess that doesn't necessarily need to happen anytime soon. I mean, we've just had a lot of rescue revelations, one with the West Generation last chapter and one with Dendro this chapter. So a third one in quick succession might be a lot of overkill. Instead, Oda might save that for a point during the raid on Onigashima, where things look like they're going less than great for the allied forces, but then with one gigantic boost of morale and manpower, we get pushed into a final, more favorable conflict. In any case, we'll be waiting a while because next week is sadly a break for One Piece. And I'm really, really hoping that global events don't go on to affect the future of the series too much because 2020 at the moment is still set to be one hell of a year for One Piece. And as always, I am anxiously awaiting more. But what do you guys think? Please leave your own thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you're keen for some more One Piece content, then please do check out some of my other videos or even subscribe to the channel for regular One Piece amazingness delivered straight to your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.